Welcome. I'm Suresh Subramani, a professor in the uh, Division of Biological Sciences and director of the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society at the University of California, San Diego. A month ago, we were all forced to shelter at home uh, in reaction to COVID-19. And at that time, a few faculty in the Division of Biological Sciences decided to put out using Zoom as well as YouTube a public lecture entitled uh, Deep Look into the Biology and Evolution of COVID-19. While we knew at that time that this topic was timely, we really had no idea of how an audience around the world would, uh, whether it would find it useful or uh, uh, exciting. And a month later, we are really humbled by the fact that so many of you have shown a genuine interest in these programs, and as well as an enthusiasm for wanting more. And uh, so that's where we are today, uh, trying to give you a little bit more about uh, this information. So um, uh, what we find is that the whole world wants to understand why is it that our immune systems that are otherwise very robust in tackling pathogens is unable to tackle uh, this particular new virus that is on the horizon. And at the same time, all of us have been waiting anxiously for a new vaccine or an antiviral drug that will take us back to our pre-COVID lifestyles. By way of perspective and background, I just want to remind you that this virus arrived at our doorstep on New Year's Eve in 2019. And since then, in the period of just four months, it has spread through the world like wildfire and has wreaked havoc along its path. And a month ago, when we did this program uh, for the first time, there were 750,000 cases worldwide. Today, there are three, over three and a half million uh, cases and 250,000 deaths worldwide, and 70,000 of which are in the United States alone. Now, not surprisingly, the scientific community and the medical community, as well as public health workers and government officials, have been working feverishly trying to find a solution to stop this virus in its tracks. And this, uh, this has been enabled in large part by the fact that there's a great deal of data sharing and information sharing all around the world, which has led to this platform called Open Science that you'll hear about. And this has led in four months to over 7,500 publications, another 2,500 publications in preprint servers that you'll hear about as well as uh, 78 new vaccine trials and over 300 drug trials, mostly using repurposed drugs from previous uh, encounters with pathogens that we've had in the past. So it is against this backdrop that we are going to uh, talk about today and in this new program, focusing on vaccines, drugs, and the evolutionary arms race. And as we did the last time, the program will be divided into three different segments. And to introduce the first segment, I just want to uh, point out to you that life on this planet began three and a half billion years ago, and every organism on the planet is attacked by pathogens during its lifetime. For the most part, though, most organisms uh, are able to uh, survive these attacks by pathogens, and this is because they have a very robust defense mechanism or immunity system. So the first topic you will hear about is uh, with respect to humans, the innate and immu uh, adaptive immunity system that we all have and how this uh, allows us to deal with pathogens that we might see in our lifetimes. Uh, secondly, because these organisms have co-evolved uh, together along with the pathogens, it sets up an arms race between the two where the immunity system of the host tries to deal with pathogens and the pathogens try to outdo the immunity system. And this arms race is very important from the point of view that when we find a new pathogen on the horizon, we look back at how we can tilt the balance in previous arms races like this and tilt this in favor of humans. And that is the second topic that we'll hear about the evolutionary arms race. And finally, everyone is nostalgic about their pre-COVID lifestyles, whether it is meeting up with your family and friends or going out to eat your favorite foods or visiting your favorite places. And of course, none of this can really happen without uh, taming this particular virus. So you've heard in the media a variety of the therapies that have been contemplated at the present time for uh, dealing with COVID-19. Uh, we will deal with the four shown in green vaccines, antiviral drugs, and to a lesser extent, 
convalescent plasma as well as mechanisms to boost and dampen our host immunity, we will talk less about stem cell therapy and traditional medicines. As in the previous program, we will have three spe speakers introduce their themes, and this will be followed by an open discussion. And finally, if we have time, we will try and answer some of the questions that were raised at the end of the last lecture uh, through your comments on YouTube. So let's launch right into the program. Uh, as we did in the previous program, uh, we will lead off with Dr. Emily Trommel, who is a professor in the section of Cell and Developmental Biology. Uh, her lab studies host pathogen interactions. She focuses on intracellular pathogens as well as viruses with RNA genomes, just like coronaviruses. So she's going to address host defense mechanisms, particularly the innate and adaptive immunity systems that humans have, and how these allow, uh, uh, protect us from pathogens. And she will also talk about the various tests that uh, have been undertaken for SARS-CoV-2 and the current concerns about both the availability of these tests as well as their accuracy. And she will mm -hmm. finally end with a discussion about the remarkable open science efforts that I just mentioned briefly. So Emily, I'm going to transition this over to you. Thanks, Suresh, for that introduction. As Suresh said, I want to address some big picture questions about SARS-CoV-2, this coronavirus that's causing the COVID-19 disease. First, I'm going to address the question of what kinds of immunity we have against viruses like SARS-CoV-2. Then I'm going to discuss a little bit about some important issues to know regarding tests for SARS-CoV-2 and the immune response against it. And then I'm going to share with you a little bit of information about how scientists are critiquing and sharing their findings about SARS-CoV-2 and how this is accelerating and becoming much more open and collaborative in this time of COVID-19. So you'll often hear that we don't have immunity against viruses that are newly entering the human population, like SARS-CoV-2. More precisely, we don't have pre-existing antibodies against this virus, but we do have an ability to respond to it with our innate immune system. So this is the form of immunity that we're born with, and it enables us to respond very rapidly to viruses, even viruses that we've never encountered before. The way this works is that we're able to detect viral molecules as foreign molecules. And to give you a sense of how that works, I want to show a viral life cycle here, which starts with a viral particle binding to receptors onto host cells, such as cells in the respiratory tract. After binding, the virus can invade into the cell and release its RNA genome. What I want to point out here is that upon replication of that genome, there are certain molecules that are formed that are molecules that are normally never seen in our cells. And these include double-stranded RNA, which is different from our normal RNA that's single-stranded and considered to be a self-molecule. So viral double-stranded RNA is recognized as a non-self-molecule by receptors that we're born with. And these receptors can detect the presence of that viral RNA and rapidly induce expression of genes that code for proteins like cytokines. And these are like the alarm bells of the innate immune system. So they call in professional immune cells to come and clear out the infection. And many times they're successful at this and then we actually don't learn about those viruses because our innate immune system can handle them. However, viruses that are successful and take hold in the human population are able to block or inactivate that innate immune response. And you're gonna hear more about this from Matt in his evolutionary arms race discussion. If the innate immune system is unable to clear an infection, there's fortunately a slower but more specific and very powerful response called the adaptive immune system that can be triggered by the innate immune system. And this is the system that people are probably more familiar with, and it includes specialized cells like T cells and B cells and antibodies. 
And it forms this immunity that is based on what we've experienced to be very dangerous and thus deserves a specific response to clear that particular infection. So it includes these cells like helper T cells that gain information about certain viruses and then inform the rest of the adaptive immune system. And of particular note, informs B cells to generate antibodies that will be specific against particular viruses. So activating the adaptive immune system together with the innate immune system provides the basis for this long-term, very specific immunity and underlies um, the principles of vaccine development that you'll hear more about from Steve in his presentation. So how do we detect the presence of this virus and the immune response to it? In our previous video, we described two general types of tests and some of the details are described there. But very generally, the first test is an RT-PCR test. And this detects the presence of viral RNA. And this gives us a measurement of who's currently infected with the virus. And it's really critical that we get more of these tests and also that we have more accurate versions of these tests. Because when they're inaccurate, they can lead to false reassurance. For example, with RT-PCR, if there's a false negative, so that the test indicates you're not infected, but you actually are infected, this can provide some false reassurance. The other general type of test is a serology test that measures for the presence of antibodies in the blood. And these tests are detecting both current infections and then also past infections because antibodies can last for a long time in our system. One important note of caution about detecting antibodies, it's clear we do mount a response to SARS-CoV-2 involving antibodies. These can be detected. We don't yet know how much protection they're gonna provide. And that's a really important topic and Steve will touch on this more during his presentation. Regarding accuracy of these tests, a, a very important concern about serology tests is the issue of false positives. So this is where the test indicates that somebody has antibodies, thus potentially immunity, and they don't. Another issue with false positives is that can it give a, a false reading of how many people have been exposed to the virus in a community. This is particularly important in the context of a population where true positives are rare. For example, if there's a population with just one in 100 people that have antibodies, and you use a serology test that's very sensitive and will pick up that one in 100 people as positive, if that test has just 1% false positive rate, another one in 100 will test positive, such that if you get a positive result from the serology test, it's a 50% chance that it's a true positive, but a 50% chance it's a false positive. And for this reason, we really need to strive to have a low false positive rate in our serology tests. So how do we assess these tests and learn about other aspects of SARS-CoV-2? I want to focus on this third point now about how we're critiquing and sharing this kind of information with the idea that the gold standard is to publish papers in a peer reviewed journal. So the goal here is that peers will help improve the quality of research before it's published and shared. A wonderful movement that's been happening in the last 15 or so years is to have peer reviewed journals that are open access. This means anybody in the world can read these papers without having to pay to access them. Regardless of cost, peer-reviewed journals can be slow, and thus there's been a response to increase the speed with which information is shared through posting to preprint servers. These are also freely available and they're sharing information at the stage oftentimes when a paper is being submitted to a journal. These have been become very popular, wonderful sources of information, such that um, now with 
preprint servers like BioArchive and MedArchive, there's thousands of COVID-19 articles already available. A note of caution, however, is that these are not peer reviewed. In some cases, they've been shared by the press without that warning about them being very preliminary. One wonderful thing about these preprint servers, however, is that anybody can be a reviewer. You can post comments on these websites and join in to this collaborative grassroots science effort that's going on. It's been wonderful to see the sharing that's going on in social media, places like Twitter and Facebook and workspaces like Slack. Here at UCSD, we actually have um, the UC San Diego screening initiative that's trying to improve the quantity and quality of SARS-CoV-2 testing. And I think this is really providing a lot of hope that we're going to continue to make advances and it's showing how science is done and that through these sorts of efforts, we're gonna be able to identify new treatments and hopefully clear this pandemic. So that background should provide some information for Matt and Steve's presentations next. And with that, I'll hand it back to Suresh. So our second speaker in the series is uh, Dr. Matt Doherty, who is an assistant professor in the section of molecular biology. He studies the evolutionary arms race in the adaptation of human immune systems on the one hand and proteins of the pathogens on the other. So he's going to discuss this evolutionary arms race between the, the viruses and the human hosts. And he will also talk about antiviral drugs and how these could help tame SARS-CoV-2. So Matt, over to you. Okay, thank you, Suresh. And uh, thank you, Emily, for the great introduction to the immune system. Uh, that will be super useful in the, the slides that I'm about to talk about. So what I wanna to talk today about is three things related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So one is this idea that we've mentioned already, but I wanna explain in a little more depth about what we mean by this host virus evolutionary arms race. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about how we can use drugs or other interventions to treat COVID-19 patients and prevent the pandemic from spreading further, both in terms of drugs that can directly target viral components that are required for the viral life cycle and things that we can actually use to target host functions to prevent viral replication. So in discussing what we mean by an evolutionary arms race, I'm gonna use this example that Emily has already brought up, which is the fact that the host immune system can work by directly targeting viral components and stopping the virus from replicating. So in this cartoon example, we can imagine this being one of those host innate immunity factors that Emily brought up that directly interfaces with a viral component. And in this simplified example, I'm showing you this little cartoon arrow here which indicates that the host protein is able to directly bind that viral protein and inhibit its activity. In this way, the host immune system is defeating the virus and we can say that the host is quote unquote winning. Of course, this is not an evolutionarily ideal situation for the virus and so there's evolutionary pressure to select for an evolved virus where that interface is changed and the host can no longer inhibit that viral component. And this allows this newly evolved virus to beat the host immune system, allowing the virus to replicate well, likely to the detriment of the host. And so now we can say that the virus is winning. But of course, this puts pressure back on the host, which will select for any variant in the population that's able to fend off the population, which will again restore binding to this new viral protein and allow the host to win again. And this type of genetic conflict goes on and on and on. And so there are a couple of important features here. First, you can see that there's never really a stable state because one side is winning this conflict. It necessarily means that the other side is losing. And so there's this kind of constant evolutionary pressure on each side to be continually innovating. This is why we call it an arms race because it's a sort of escalating process by which these systems can continually try to outcompete each other. And finally, in this cartoon example, but also in real life, we see that these changes are happening at the direct interfaces between the virus and the host. So at this surface here and this surface here, constantly remodeling both the molecular details of the host virus interface, as well as the outcome of the viral infection. Now I gave you this sort of toy example, but of course there's real world implications of these escalating arms race. 
So if you follow this out in time, as time goes on, these interfaces here will change over time. And in humans, that host virus interaction may have evolved a certain way over time, where now through this arms race, these surfaces have been reshaped to look quite distinct from how they looked uh, in the previous uh, sort of ancestor of humans. And this co-evolution of the human immune system with human viruses is one of the reasons that we think we can do either a good job of defending against or are good at not having a large amount of pathogenic symptoms, this so-called uh, idea of tolerance, where we're infected with viruses that have been circulating in the human population for a while. And relevant to CO-19, and I brought up this example last time, there are coronaviruses that are related to SARS-CoV-2 that cause a common cold, so-called seasonal coronaviruses, and these don't make people incredibly sick. And the reason for that is that these viruses have likely been circulating in humans for a while, and both the virus and the host have probably adapted to each other to the point where there's not a huge degree of pathogenesis from infection. So that's a consequence of this co-evolutionary arms race. Now, if we imagine another population, say in bats, where we think SARS-CoV-2 originated, we again expect that the immunity proteins have evolved with bat viruses, although through a probably a different path than we've gone through. And so in these bat populations, the circulating bat viruses are either blocked by the immune system or the bat tolerates viral replication without a lot of pathogenesis. And so this sort of leads to this principle that most viruses that have been in host populations for a long time don't cause severe pathogenesis. The problem, of course, arises when a virus is able to jump a species. And this is a process that we call zoonosis, as I defined last time, and that's when things become a real problem. And this is exactly what's happened with SARS-CoV-2, where this virus was circulating either in bats or an intermediate host, but now has moved into the human population. And now the virus is mismatched with the host immune system, and because of this mismatch, we have a case where we're either unable to mount an effective immune response to defeat the virus, the immune system overactivates in response to the virus and causes pathogenic tissue damage, or in the case of SARS-CoV-2, probably both of these things. And this mismatch is the fundamental reason why every major human pandemic virus that we know of, including some that Steve will probably talk about in a bit, has always originated in another species. So with that, I'll, uh, knowing there's this mismatch between the virus and host, the question returns as to how we can use drugs or other treatments to restore this balance in order to treat COVID-19 and prevent it from spreading more. And I'll discuss this in two parts since we can either think about developing treatments that target uh, the virus directly or treatments that target host functions that the virus actually needs. So first, I'll start off by saying there's an enormous number of drug trials that are going on right now. As of May 1, there were 1,290 trials in various phases going on throughout a huge number of countries. So as Emily mentioned, you know, this has really been an unprecedented global response. The other thing I'll mention, and, and Suresh brought this up, is, is that many of these drugs that are in trials are so-called repurposed drugs. And what I mean by that is, is that we already know that these drugs work against something else, that be it an infectious disease or some other human condition. And we're now testing to see whether any of these actually work against SARS-CoV-2. And the reason for that is that it's just much faster to take a drug that we already know works and we already know is relatively safe in humans and test it against a new disease. But that said, of course, there are many more drugs that are being developed to directly work against COVID-19, but... In terms of the first trials, a lot of this is coming from these repurposed drugs. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, the, these drugs can either target the virus directly or the host function or take advantage of this amazing adaptive immunity uh, system that we have that Emily mentioned and Steve will talk about a little bit more. And so if we look down this list, we can, you know, as I've indicated here in colors, we can see that some of these target the virus directly some of these target host functions that the virus needs or are important for immunity. And the last couple uh, actually leverage this idea of host adaptive immunity, either through vaccine trials or convalescent plasmid, as Suresh mentioned. So when we think about drugs that can actually target the virus directly, we really need to go back to this life cycle that Emily brought up. 
and really go through what the, the sort of three most important steps in that viral life cycle are. So at the first step, we have the virus uh, using its spike protein to bind to the human ACE2 receptor and then getting trafficked into the cell. The second is where the viral RNA gets turned into, uh, gets translated into host proteins and actually, or viral proteins and processed into their final form. And the last step is the step where new viral RNA is produced by the viral RNA polymerase. So one set of drugs that, we, that are in trials right now are ones that actually target this protein processing step. More specifically, SARS-CoV-2, similar to HIV and hepatitis C virus, has a protein called a protease that cuts up the viral proteins to produce their final functional form. So this is an essential part of the life cycle of these viruses and has been a great target in is what is actually quite effective drug treatments for HIV and HCV. So some of these drugs that are being used against HIV and HCV are being trialed against SARS-CoV-2, hoping that they also hit the SARS-CoV-2 protease. And of course, there's many more drugs at an earlier stage of development that specifically target the um, SARS-CoV-2 protease. The other major viral drug target um, is the this step of RNA polymerase um, and RNA production. Again, this targets an enzyme that doesn't exist in the host, but is absolutely required for the viral life cycle. And here we have a drug that's uh, gotten some really nice press recently, which is called remdesivir, which was actually a drug that was developed to target the viral RNA polymerase of the Ebola virus, but seems to be effective against SARS-CoV-2. And there's several other drugs that we have uh, in trials that target other viral RNA polymerases, as well as, as well as many other lead compounds aimed specifically at SARS-CoV-2 RNA polymerase. So those are sort of the two main points that we're trying to hit on the virus with current drugs and repurposed drugs. There's actually several other potential viral components to target, but we just don't currently have drugs that we know work against those type of targets in other viruses. So those are more in the developmental rather than clinical trial stage. And to be effective, we will actually probably need to target multiple points in the viral life cycle as we do with HIV and HCV, since evolution of resistance against the single drug could be expected to happen pretty quickly. So leaving the, the viral targeting for, for now and going back to this idea about targeting host processes, there's actually several categories of drugs uh, that target these host functions. And the idea here is, is that because the virus needs the host for so many different processes, and because the host immune response works so well against so many other viruses, that we should be able to target those processes and try to bring, bring things back in line with how our body responds to something like a seasonal coronavirus. Unfortunately, we have many treatments that have been developed to target host functions, but we just need to know whether these are actually effective against COVID-19. So for the first example of these types of drugs, I'm gonna remind you of that process of viral entry and that it relies heavily on host cellular machinery. So there are three places that people are looking right now that take advantage of various host processes. The first is a host protein called TMPRSS2 that's required to mature the viral spike protein so that it can actually bind in enteral cells. And we already have drugs that target that protease. We also have drugs that target the human ACE2 protein and could potentially block its interaction with the viral spike protein. And we also have uh, drugs that actually can um, disrupt the process of trafficking things, including viruses from outside the cell to the inside of the cell. And as I mentioned, the other sort of big host function that's being targeted is the innate immune response that Emily introduced earlier and I brought up with this arms race discussion. And as I mentioned here, the idea is that the human immune response is fundamentally mismatched to SARS-CoV-2, which really only recently entered the human population. And so we could think about two ways to, to approach this. The first is to uh, kind of up the direct antiviral immune response, for example, by treating people with type 1 interferon that Emily mentioned earlier. This could really help if the virus is preventing the natural innate immune response from being effectively deployed against the virus, and there's certainly some evidence that uh, this virus is able to do that. The other way that we can modulate the immune response is to try to dampen the potentially pathogenic inflammatory response. So inflammation appears to be a major cause of pathogenesis in, in people infected with this, as well as many other zoonotic viruses. 
So people are also trying to use drugs to correct this potential mismatch between sort of an overactive inflammatory response and the virus. So I'll just summarize before I turn things back to Suresh and Steve. First, I'll reiterate that these evolutionary arms races that I described are at play all around us and have really shaped the way that we uh, respond to both circulating viruses such as seasonal coronaviruses, as well as zoonotic viruses like SARS-CoV-2. But of course, the good news emerging is that we have a huge amount of effort going into developing and testing drugs or other treatments that can either target the host or the virus. And some of these are already showing uh, some efficacy in clinical trials with many, many, many more results to come in, in hopefully the next uh, few months. So with that, I will turn it back to Suresh, and I look forward to more discussion in a bit. Thank you so much, Matt. Our final panelist is Dr. Steve Hedrick, who is a distinguished, distinguished professor in the section of molecular biology. His lab is interested in the maintenance of the balance between the different types of lymphocytes that exist in the immune system of mammals. And he will talk to us about vaccines, as well as the issues that surround that the creation, approval, and safety. So Steve, I'm going to hand this over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks to Suresh for a kind introduction and to Emily and Matt for setting the stage for a discussion of vaccines and the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic. I have studied immunology for many years. And um, most recently, I've been interested in something called um, uh, disease ecology. And that means uh, I'm interested in what, why infectious disease epidemics are inevitable in the human population, and how history shows us that these epidemics don't seem to end until most people have been infected and survived, or they've been vaccinated. And then finally, without a vaccine, epidemic diseases um, after the, the epidemic has waned, remain in the population, usually as childhood diseases. Now, a very important part of the human experience turns out to be epidemics and pandemics. And so we know that since the dawn of history, at least 2,500 years, the human experience has been um, littered with one epidemic or pandemic disease after another. And they've included diseases like typhus and smallpox and the bubonic plague and cholera and yellow fever. And the, one of the most famous ones in the 20th century, of course, was the so-called Spanish flu. And in the last part of the 20th century, uh, the human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS. It appears that these types of pandemics are inevitable. And the question is, why are they inevitable? And why do they occur in the human population, but not necessarily seen in many other populations that we've studied? So one way to look at this is in looking at the size of the world population over the last 12,000 12, years. And what you can see is that 12,000 years ago, there were only 4 million people in the entire world. That means that people lived in small dispersed communities of a few hundred people without much interaction. With time though, human beings found the ability to domesticate plants and animals. And that had two effects. One effect was that it allowed people to remain in place and build communities and, um, and eventually towns and cities. That has the effect of causing people to live at high density. The other effect was that it allowed or it caused people to sample all of the diseases and infectious agents from cows and goats and sheep and horses and birds. And occasionally those infectious diseases that came from these animals would be able to, as, as Matt and, and Emily uh, pointed out, occasionally they would be able to jump into the human population. And because people were living at high density, those diseases could spread rapidly. And this, this process started probably about 2,500 to 3,000 years ago um, based on writings uh, in history. 
And they've only accelerated ever since. And you can see that this makes sense because the density of the human population has uh, exponentially increased in the last century, such that now we add about a billion people every 12 years to the human population. So if a disease arrives in the human population anew, it can spread within weeks to the entire world. And especially in, in areas of, um, of high populations, it can spread very, very rapidly. So let's look at this in a little more detail um, schematically. And here I have on the left a, a typical small dispersed community in which those connections are not uh, realized. That's to be contrasted with um, another community that consists of rural towns in which people can interact and there are direct interactions between towns. And finally, that can con we can contrast that with huge population centers, megalopolises, in which millions and millions of people live together and interact on a daily basis. Now, if there's one infected person in each of these different groups, you can see the difference that will result. In the case of the small dispersed communities, the disease stays put. In the rural towns, it spreads slowly, and in huge population centers, it spreads very rapidly to almost the entire population. So density makes a big difference in the way epidemics spread. But the size of the population also makes, the absolute size also makes a big difference. So if you have a small population and a disease like measles ends up in that small population, it will flash through the population, infect most people, and then run out of new hosts. In that case, it fades away from the population. However, if such a, a, a virus lands in a large population, there is always a source of new uninfected hosts in the form of um, newborn children. And so the way that works then is that these diseases flash through the population, infect almost everybody. Most adults are immune or they perish. And then there is an oscillating epidemics that occur. Every time the population of newborn children increase past a certain threshold, a new epidemic ensues. And then because it, uh, many of those children are now immune, the epidemic uh, recedes and then uh, comes back again. And you can see that this repeat, repeated itself throughout history until we had a vaccine. And you can see when we had the first licensed vaccine, the incidence of measles dropped to almost nothing. And then we realized we needed a second dose. And so that uh, once we had two doses of the vaccine, that we have essentially no cases of measles in the United States at the present time, unless it's imported from another country. Now, the current state of COVID prevalence due to social distancing is that there, is a, there are a small number of people who are infected, and because we are social distancing, they are not realizing these potential interactions. So there are very few people in most populations that are currently infected. However, if this changes and these interactions become realized, then the virus has many, many um, sensitive hosts to spread to, and we would see a, a reemergence of an epidemic. Now, one way to look at this, and, and many of you have probably heard of this, is through the uh, basic reproduction number, or R0, R0. And what that number represents is the number of uh, people that will be infected by a single sick person. So, for example, in the case of measles, one sick person is thought to be able to give rise to 16 um, disease, uh, infected people. Now, one thing to note, though, is this R0 figure is not, uh, is not static. It depends upon the population, the population density, the way people intermingle, and the way they are, uh, transmit from city to city. But at the present time, we, see, we think we see that the COVID-19 disease spreads with an R0 of about two and a half. Now, that number will probably change because we really don't know the incidence of disease or the prevalence of disease at the, at the moment. 
And um, it also changes with the uh, progression of the epidemic. As there are fewer and fewer people to be infected, the R0 can change quite dramatically. Now, currently, we are uh, social distancing. And so we're reducing social exposure by, um, let's say, something like 75%. Under those circumstances, the model predicts that one person, even after 30 days, will only infect uh, two, two and a half people. However, if, so, if we reduce social exposure, if, if social exposure is only reduced by 50%, so that, that there is more intermingling, in 30 days, a single person would be predicted to give rise to 15 infected people. The question is, what would happen if we reduced, um, if we stopped reducing social exposure altogether? So we went back to uh, pre-2019 uh, interactions. And the prediction is this, that one person could give rise to over 400 infected people in 30 days. And this is probably similar to what happened in New York City when the virus first landed there and people did not realize that there was an epidemic being spread. Now, just today, the uh, University of Pennsylvania Wharton uh, School released a budget model in which they looked at the results of opening the economy um, partially or fully. And, and they, they predict that if we open the, the economy partially before June, we could save 4.4 million jobs, but at a cost of about 45,000 additional deaths by June, whereas fully opening the economy before June could save 18 million jobs, but at a cost of 230,000 additional deaths that would occur before June. So we want to do something to change this. We, we, don't, we can't possibly sustain draconian social distancing forever. We need to have a way to ensure that the population is not going to spread the disease. And the way to do that is shown here. So here is our um, present world. We have a huge number of people who are still uninfected. We have, as, as Suresh indicated, we have about 3.5 million confirmed cases of the virus in the world right now. That's probably a low estimate. You could say it's at least 7 million cases, um, confirmed cases in the world. But there are 7 billion or 7.8 billion people in the world. So that means that less than one in a thousand people have the potential to be immune. And as, as, um, as Emily indicated, we don't really even know that having the disease confers strong immunity. We hope it does. It may, but we still don't know that. So how can we go from a, a world like this, where at any moment the disease can break out into the population, to a world in which we can go back to living the way we, we did? And there are two ways. One is to come up with a vaccine in which that's effective and confers immunity on most people in the world. Or, or the other is, which is probably not acceptable, is to allow the pandemic to wash over the entire world, um, conferring immunity uh, as, as it infects people. So this is where we want to get to. We want to get to a world in which most people are immune and because most people are immune, even an occasional uh, diseased person will not be able to spread the disease because of this concept of herd immunity. As long as most people are immune, the disease doesn't have the density of susceptible hosts in which to spread. So this is our goal. Find a vaccine, or as Matt said, find a very effective drug that can knock the virus out entirely. In terms of a vaccine, how can we do this? Well. There are three types of vaccines that are in use right now that have been licensed um, for the various diseases that we've been able to tame by the use of, 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 of immunity in the population. One of them is a whole inactivated virus. So this is similar to the way that Jonas Salk made the original vaccine to polio virus. Large amounts of virus were grown up and then treated with a, a chemical, usually formalin, to inactivate the virus. 
So the immune system still sees this as a foreign entity and makes antibodies to this virus, but the virus is inactivated so it can't infect the individual. Another way that we have of making a vaccine which is even more effective is to make a live attenuated vaccine, which is similar to the way that Sabin made a polio vaccine that eventually conferred immunity on most of the world. In this way, a virus is grown and selected such that it still infects an individual, a, a human being, but it doesn't cause disease. A third way is we take a piece of, of a virus and we produce it in the lab in some fashion, a subunit of, of the virus, for instance, the spike protein on the surface of the virus, and we use that as a vaccine. That can induce an, an antibody response to that subunit, which can then in turn confer immunity. Now, in more recent years, we've been able to find other ways of making vaccines. One of them is to use recombinant DNA techniques to take a piece of, uh, of the information from the virus itself and place it into another virus that's not disease causing. So this is sort of similar to the live attenuated um, approach. And that is you have a virus that contains a piece of the, um, the epidemic virus, but it doesn't cause disease. That still will confer, cause the immune system to, to produce a response and confer immunity on the, on the patient. And another novel way of producing a vaccine is to use the genetic instructions that come from the virus directly in the form of either DNA or RNA. And in that case, the DNA or the RNA is, we hope, will be taken up by our own host cells and then, as I'll show you, translated into a protein that then confers immunity. So let's look at that. So this is a, um, the means of making a uh, RNA vaccine. There's, there's two variations. The first variation is that you, you synthesize a, a portion of RNA that encodes the, for instance, the spike protein of the COVID virus. This piece of RNA, a nucleic acid, is encapsulated into a lipid nanoparticle that is then taken up through this same endocytosis um, pr process that, um, that Matt talked about and, and, and Emily talked about. The RNA can get out of the um, lipid nanoparticle and then be translated by the host translational machinery directly to produce viral proteins. These viral proteins can then be on the cell surface or they can be secreted and then the immune system in the form of B cells making antibodies can uh, recognize these viral proteins and then produce antibodies that would then uh, bind to the native virus and cover up all of the spike proteins so that, those spike, so that the virus can no longer bind to a host cell and cause, um, and cause an infection. Now, there's the, the only variation that, that this shows is that you can also make a piece of RNA that encodes another gene called a replicase so that once this RNA molecule gets into the cell, it can not only be translated, but it can replicate itself and amplify the number of RNA molecules in the cell that will then produce uh, proteins at even higher levels and, and perhaps make a more potent vaccine. So why do we have vaccines for some viruses but not others? What are the problems involved? Well, if there's an infectious agent that induces sterilizing immunity, that is like measles or mumps, an infectious agent infects someone, you get rid of the, you, your immune system clears the virus and you have lifelong immunity. When that's the, the, the case for a particular infectious agent, we know that we can make a vaccine. It's easy. There are no exceptions to that. And that's true for measles, mumps, and rubella, and, and, and several other diseases. But when an infectious disease is cleared, but there's little or fleeting immunity, it's much harder. For instance, for common cold viruses, there are too many types. There are about 200 different types of viruses that can cause cold symptoms. Or the immunity to such viruses can be short-lived. And this includes the four different coronaviruses that Matt talked about. We know that if you get infected with a coronavirus, you do make an antibody response. It probably is neutralizing, but it may not last forever. It may last a year or two. 
we don't know yet, and we certainly don't know for the, the current epidemic virus. And sometimes a virus is never cleared. This is the hardest form of a, of a virus to make a, a vaccine to. And the example, of course, is HIV, which mutates at a very rapid rate. And the viruses that avoid an antibody response that the uh, host makes have a selected gro selective growth advantage. And so far, we've been completely unable to make a vaccine um, to, to, the HIV, to HIV. Are there advances that will allow us to a more rapid development of the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, there are. There's, there's tremendous uh, progress that have been made in molecular biology and cell biology over the last two decades. Um, and it's allowed us to determine the genetic instruction set of this new epidemic virus, not in years that it used to take or in months that it took for the original SARS virus, but in this case, in weeks. And it's an RNA genome that consists of 30,000 base, bases, and it's about 75% identical to the original SARS virus. We have new types of vaccines that are under development that I talked about, in, in, including the RNA vaccines that allow us to make a vaccine perhaps without having to scale up to grow huge amounts of virus and, and chemically inactivate it. And as I mentioned, these are the RNA-based vaccines. We also can make recombinant subunit vaccines where we can grow bits of the virus um, in, in, uh, in culture at very large amounts and use those parts of the virus to make a vaccine. And we think that that might be another way of, of making a vaccine in this case. And finally, we have experimental animals that can mimic the human immune system. And that is they are genetically deficient mice that lack an immune system, but they can be transplanted with a human immune system so that when we immunize these animals, they make a human antibody response, and then we can test them for their sensitivity to uh, virus infection. And finally, what are the safety concerns for a novel vaccine? Well, sometimes of some types of antibody responses make the virus more infectious. So the encounter with a live virus actually increases the probability of severe disease or even death. This is called antibody-mediated enhancement. And examples are uh, dengue fever. If you uh, are immunized to one form of dengue fever or you are infected by one strain of dengue fever, you are much more sensitive to all the other forms. It's also true for the early attempts at a SARS vaccine. The very first one that was attempted showed this type of antibody-mediated enhancement. So we have to be careful about this. Some vaccines can result in immune misdirection, whereby uh, encounter with a live virus produces an ineffective or even a deleterious response. Um, we see that with a respiratory syncytial virus that was um, studied in the, in the 1960s. And, um, People who were immunized with the RSV vaccine um, were very sensitive to the RSV reinfection, and it was due to a, a, a misapplication of the immune system. Um, this is also true for uh, uh, mycobacteria leprae, but that's for another lecture. And rarely vaccines can cause autoimmunity. So how do we know when a, a, a vaccine is safe and how long does it take to make it? Um, candidate vaccines are tested first on experimental animals and then small groups of patients moving to larger groups as safety becomes apparent. So you've probably heard of this. There's phase one, which consists of about 50 patients, phase two, hundreds, and phase three, or thousands of patients are, can be uh, vaccinated. This type of um, a development usually takes about five to 10 years. And we're hopeful that in this case, in the case of a worldwide pandemic, which is redundant, but it's, it's a pandemic, we can do this in under two years. That would be the world record for a vaccine. But be, using novel technologies and um, recombinant DNA techniques and RNA techniques and some of the other things I've mentioned, uh, we're hopeful that by the end of 2021, we'll at least have results on a new generation of vaccines. The reason it takes so long usually is that vaccinated and unvaccinated groups are monitored for the natural incidence of disease, and that can take quite a long time. Although now there are at least 7,000 people who have signed up to uh, be 
uh, infected with the virus in order to test new vaccines as they come online. After clinical trials, when the vaccine is released, um, the CDC still monitors safety for forever, in fact. And they have uh, several ways of doing this. They have something called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System that is uh, countrywide and looks for any kind of adverse event that results from a vaccine uh, administration. They have the Vaccine Safety Data Link and the Post Licensure rapid immunization safety monitoring techniques. These are all different types of, of systems that look at, that, that are, involve hospitals and um, uh, doctors who administer vaccines in order to make sure that any kind of an adverse reaction is reported. And finally, there's an, uh, another system that they have called the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. So I, I wanna leave you with the idea that Epidemics are an, an inevitable consequence of civilization. But another consequence of civilization is that we've been able to develop tools in order to overcome epidemics. And we hope, we're, and our, our best tool is, is the uh, production of a vaccine or the production of effective drugs, the way Matt uh, spoke about. We only have, at this point, social distancing, and we're hopeful in the next few months or the next year we'll have uh, vaccination. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Let's move then to the Q&A um, and the discussion. So Matt, I want to start with you. You talked about uh, the ability to develop drugs both against the host or the virus. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the pros and cons, uh, or should one try both? Is one better than the other? Uh, wh what are the factors that go into this? Yeah. So. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. Um, as I mentioned, the, the big uh, concern about a drug targeted against a virus is just resistance, right? So in HIV and HCV, we know that viruses can evolve resistance very fast. And so we usually need to have two or three or more drugs in a cocktail in order to prevent resistance from emerging against a single target. Obviously, the advantage of targeting a virus is that you're hitting a protein that doesn't even exist in the human cell. And so there's a bigger sort of therapeutic window there uh, that we can target and not worry about adverse side effects. You know, the host, uh, targeting the host obviously has the, the opposite of those. There's potential for off targets, but less concern about uh, evolving resistance. So I want to transition to Emily. Uh, you know, there's been a big debate uh, about the need for uh, testing, and you pointed uh, the, the issue about the accuracy of the testing. Why is it so difficult to get a reliable and accurate test? Uh, or are we just trying to move too fast to get to the other end or to sell a product uh, to give us the situation? Yeah, that's a really important question. I think there have been some efforts um, on the part of, for example, the FDA to increase the availability of testing for antibodies. And I believe on March 16th, they lifted restrictions on companies having to report accuracy data, I think with the goal of trying to increase the number of tests. Unfortunately, what happened is that there was an increased number of inaccurate tests. And fortunately today, they've reversed that decision. So now there should increase the accuracy of tests that are available. And, you know, I think None of this is necessarily rocket science, but it does take time and it takes um, dedicated effort. And ideally we would have a coordinated effort so that we would have one very, very accurate serology test, one very accurate RT-PCR test that everybody in the country would use. And I think that's really what we would, we would strive for and hopefully we can get to. So just today, the FDA approved uh, an antibody test from Roche and uh, the company claims that it's 100% accurate. Nothing is 100%, but it must be pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. They're rounding up from something pretty high. <laughs> yeah. No, this, this is uh, good. Uh, this, uh, I, this is open to anyone. So we talked a little bit about uh, efforts to boost immunity as well as dampen immunity. And to the lay audience, this might seem uh, contradictory, you know. Uh, and so uh, I want to uh, ask about the different phases of the infection. At what point do you want to boost immunity and at what point might you want to dampen immunity, particularly 
with respect to the later stage effects like cytokine storms where the immune system goes haywire. Steve, you wanted to start and then we'll go with the others? Well, sure. Of course, you'd like to boost immunity initially, so that would be to try to boost the innate immune system and perhaps the early antibody response. But the problem with the immune system in with with the immune response that we see is that much of the disease process is due to immunopathology, meaning the immune system is trying to attack the virus or the virally infected cells more accurately. And the problem is there's a lot of collateral damage. And, and in this particular virus, what, what, uh, what happens is that the immune system, the cells of the immune system infiltrate the lungs. That, that causes an inflammatory response, which causes fluid to build up in the alveoli. And once the fluid builds up in the alveoli, uh, that you lose the ability to exchange oxygen and that can lead to respiratory arrest. So you, you'd like to boost the initial immune response. And I think as you're getting at um, then, but, but once there's an inflammatory response that occurs, then you'd like to dampen that. And one of the major inflammatory cytokines is something called IL-6. And so the, the uh, drugs that are in testing right now are drugs that either block the IL-6 itself or block the IL-6 receptor. Thank you. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, that, that, was, that was pretty perfect, uh, except to say that on my list of uh, clinical trials, I think IL-6 uh, modulation was something like the third or fourth most common right. clinical trial. So um, it is definitely a, a big target that we're going after. Yeah, so we've also heard a lot in the liter in the uh, media about uh, plasma from infected patients. Uh, uh, can someone outline how this works and uh, uh, whether clinical trials are going on in this area also? Yeah, so there's definitely several clinical trials going on. Um, you know, the basis for this is actually, you know, even predates uh, sort of what we really developed starting vaccines, which was if you just took plasma from a person that had been infected and cleared that infection and treated someone with that. So transferring those antibodies, um, you could uh, provide potentially the advantage of the antibodies, even in the, the person that didn't actually raise those antibodies. So um, it's obviously a very different process to harvest all of that uh, material from a person that has been infected and treat someone and there's all sorts of issues of, you know, uh, reactivity and things like that. But um, uh, it's certainly a very effective way to prevent virus virus replication. And, and, you know, if you look at things like Ebola, it was actually the one of the first lines of defense that was uh, deployed against Ebola was this type of idea. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, you showed very beautifully... Uh how different population sizes affect the ability of the virus to spread. And we are all anxiously awaiting a vaccine or an antiviral drug. But if we were to get a vaccine, we also have this other problem that 40% of the people in this country don't believe in vaccines um, or don't want to take them. So how would this work? Would a vaccine have to be imposed as a mandatory uh, requirement uh, across the population? It's very clear that the, um, the best defense is a population that has herd immunity. So just getting the vaccine gives you some measure of protection, but you are actually much more protected if a large, large percentage of the population has been vaccinated. Um, and and for, for, I, I always go back to measles because it's, it's, it's such an interesting um, example. If the level of vaccination falls below about 95%, you can start to see the reemergence of measles. Uh, now, measles is, of course, immensely um, contagious, so this one might not be the same. But um, you really, ideally, we really like everyone to be vaccinated. Um, the way they do that for children is, of course, they don't allow children to attend public schools without a, a regime of vaccination. Um, but this is a political issue that uh, I'm less well uh, able to talk about, I must say. <laughs> so, Emily, I want to go back to you. Uh, 
uh, when you talked about the fact that in the serology test we're looking for antibodies uh, that uh, people might have against SARS-CoV-2. So I want to raise two issues. These antibodies that we're looking for, would they cross-react with uh, uh, exposure to one of the other coronaviruses? What are the chances there? And could that be contributing to some of these false positives? And secondly, what do we know about whether the presence of antibodies correlates with immunity, and if so, for how long? Right, yeah. So as was mentioned earlier, there's four circulating um, coronaviruses that um, there are going to be, there is going to be some cross-reactivity in some cases between um, antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 and coronavirus. And that can contribute. I think there's several sources of false positives for the antibody test, but that could be one source of false positive. And my understanding about um, whether or not these antibodies will be long lasting is that I think unlike with some other viruses, antibodies against coronaviruses aren't typically as long lasting. And so I think that's of concern in terms of how long a vaccine would be effective and what sort of, um, yeah, what sort of perspective we have for going forward um, with just simply one vaccine. As, as Steve mentioned, you know, we realized we needed a booster for measles and in all likelihood we may need something similar for SARS-CoV-2 and maybe multiple boosts. Mm -hmm. Matt, you pointed out that uh, uh, we have a variety of drugs that have been repurposed from uh, 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 being effective against other diseases. So uh, what are the cautionary steps that one has to take before they're approved for use against uh, COVID-19? Because there's a tendency to say, well, these drugs work in a related virus and perhaps another related coronavirus. Why can't we just take it off the shelf and start giving it to people? What's the problem with that approach? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I'm not sure I have a complete answer for this. I, uh, one thing you uh, we certainly want to make sure of is that these drugs are actually effective, right? Because there's a there's a severe opportunity cost to treating someone with a drug when uh, that drug is not effective and they could be receiving another drug, right? So, um, you know, we've seen some of this happen with some of the, you know, sort of popular sentiment around drugs that have then turned out to have absolutely zero evidence for actually being effective. And now there's people in trials and there's money and there's effort and things like that going into this. And, you know, that just seems sort of wasteful. So I think the, the, the biggest issue, at least with some of these drugs, is, is their, their sort of efficacy against this virus. Um, I think the other concern would always be, you know, what is the to or is sort of the off target effects of these drugs or the toxicity of these drugs when given to people that are uh, already in some sort of pathogenic state, right? So, um, you know, if you're treating people that, you know, don't have a severe respiratory infection with drugs, they may have very different uh, side effects than people that are in severe respiratory distress. And so I think that's another concern that we really need to worry about, about just sort of immediately launching in and saying, oh, these drugs are known to be safe. Um, they're known to be safe in, you know, potentially healthier individuals than the people that they may necessarily be going into. I wanted to actually follow up, if possible, on the comments regarding whether to target host or virus. And I think this is something that maybe was mentioned in our previous video, but is worth mentioning again, which is that the coronavirus, unlike many other RNA viruses, can proofread. So it has more accurate replication and thus may be less likely to evolve resistance. And so I think that, you know, with caveats in place that we are still learning about this virus. Um, at the same time, I think it does provide further support that drugs targeted against the virus might be effective. And I think as with many of these antiviral therapies, we would want a combination as, as Matt had commented on. Suresh, I would like to go back to um something uh, about the antibodies. And it occurs to me that if there is a cross-reaction between the uh, circulating human co uh, coronaviruses and this coronavirus, that these antibodies would be what we call low affinity. 
Yeah. And that's exactly the prescription for causing antibody-mediated enhancement. And yeah, this is absolutely. pure speculation, but I wonder if some, some of the reason that people have differential sensitivity to this virus is that they've been previously infected with one of the seasonal coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's an important area of research that people will be focusing on. I want to go back to the first lecture, and there's still, uh, you know, Emily, at that point, you had indicated quite clearly, as well as Matt, from the evolutionary point of view point, that this virus came uh, from bats, either directly or indirectly through, through uh, something else. And uh, yet now there's still debate in the media as to whether this is a man-made virus or, or a naturally occurring virus that jumped from one host to the other. Can, can you shed some light on this issue and you, uh, give me a, a personal views on this? I guess what I would say is that as scientists, we use a principle called Occam's razor, where the simplest explanation is the most likely explanation. And nature is far wiser than we are. As much as we would like to imagine somebody in a lab cooking up this virus, and there's a number of pieces of evidence that argue against that, although it's hard to completely disprove it, I think it is far easier to understand based on much of what Matt described and Steve described that this is a virus that was circulating in bat populations. It spilled over into humans and we just didn't have, basically as Matt said, it's a mismatch between our immune system and what's present in this virus. And it, like I said, it's hard to completely eliminate that explanation. There's just, almost no evidence to support it. And by far the simplest explanation is that this came from nature. And I think all as scientists and as, as humans, we need to band together to figure out how to fight this virus and not dispute and blame and point fingers where it's not justified. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I mean, I guess the only thing I would add is that there's a very clear historical precedent. I mean, even within the last 20 years of coronaviruses transmitting via this mechanism from a, you know another animal species into the human population so SARS was about 20 years ago MERS was you know somewhere on the order of 10 years ago um and you know there so it's not like this is the first time this has happened so it's it it's really i think it's not only not supported by the data but it's also very I think destructive to be uh, sort of entertaining these ideas that, you know, someone is to blame for this, right? That we should just be uh, figuring out how to solve this problem. And I think the intelligence community doesn't feel that there's any evidence to justify it either, I, as far as I can tell. That's right. Yeah. So before we end, uh, I'd like to see if any one of you wants to bring up any topic that we have not g gone into in, in sufficient depth uh, with respect to what we talked about today. I guess the only thing I would maybe bring up is um, a question that I don't know who else might have gotten this from uh, a direct email, but I got from somebody which I thought was sort of interesting, which is this idea that, you know, this virus evolved to do this and how did it evolve to do this and the reality is is that there's so much as you know emily just mentioned there's so much diversity in nature so even just this idea of the virus evolved to use the human ace2 receptor i mean there are there are, we actually know this that there are coronaviruses that are circulating that just by happenstance can use the the human ace2 receptor so it's not necessarily uh, a targeted thing. It's just there's so much diversity in these viral populations that, you know, and when we're being exposed as much as, you know, uh, Steve just brought up and uh, Justin brought up last time that that just by uh, sort of random chance, there's going to be a virus that's going to be able to sort of take advantage of this. And the higher the population densities are and the more we're kind of running into uh, other species, I think this is only going to, these pandemics are only going to increase, um, as Steve yes. sort of alluded to. Well, I want to thank all of you for wonderful presentations and a very active discussion. 
and uh, uh, and I also want to thank the audience for their interest and enthusiasm in encouraging us to do more of this. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy the program. Thank you.